a 100 kilogram squat and a one kilo loaded sprint. Which one of those do you think has a higher kinetic energy? Welcome to part two. This is Coach Joe again, part two of wearable resistance introduction. Why kinetic energy? Well, kinetic energy tells us a lot about movement specificity and transference. Okay, when you're looking at the kinetic energy of a movement, it's telling you about outcome, energy sources, where your specificity lies. If we take a look at kinetic energy, what is the formula? One half mv squared. We look at the 100 kilo squat. 100 kilo squat moving on average about point, half a meter, 0.58 of a meter per second, right? That's the speed of an average squat at that weight. Gives us a kinetic energy of 17.4 kilograms per meters per second. Now let's go and take a look at the sprinter with just one kilo of load on the shorts or the leg or whatever part of the body we have it on. But that's moving at 6.1 meters per second. And when you do the math on that, you get a kinetic energy of 18.6 kilograms per meters per second. And what that tells us is a light load moving at high speed has an incredible impact on the body because we always think that heavy is more. And I'm here to tell you now, light is the new heavy. How do I load? Where do I load? What do I do? This is an area we call technical conditioning and I will be doing a separate session on technical conditioning. First thing you've got to understand is what the tool was designed to do. Well, the most important part is this load. And this load was very specifically developed based on muscle architecture, what's called muscle pination in sports science. And that means it's got a belly and an insertion point like a muscle. And it's really important to understand that. That wasn't luck or coolness. It took us almost seven years to figure out. The belly is where most of the weight is. And as you can imagine with that arrow, it, you can create specific feelings, momentums, inertias by putting that belly on certain parts of the body. And it's really important to understand a couple of those basic patterns before you start loading. Now to put the context on that, think of a car tire. Everyone's gone down to have their tire wheels balanced. Now you've got a 20 to 30 kilo tire, which is 40 to 60 pounds plus. And it's a little out of wonk and you can feel it driving down the road. You go to the mechanic, he puts it on the machine. They spin that tire. They see the whiff. They calculate the machine tells them exactly where to put a small weight. And that small weight is as little as five to 10 grams quarter to half an ounce, but it's put in an exact specific position. They go back and test it. And all of a sudden that tire is spinning perfectly. And what does that does for, do for the performance? Increases your economy, improves your speed, improves your handling, your stability, your safety, and most important, your wear and tear. Exigent and wearable resistance is exactly like this scenario. A small weight on a big, strong moving body at high speed has a tremendous impact. Six main loading positions we'll talk about. First one, upper versus lower loading. This is really simple. Biomechanical terms, proximal versus distal. The upper arm, the belly near the rotating joint. Let's say I'm throwing, all right? The main rotating joint being the shoulder, putting the belly near that shoulder means it will feel lighter, it'll feel easier. It's more in a speed focus because the terminal end of the movement is very light and it puts less stress on the joint. And now you think about lower or distal loading, putting the belly low or down on the arm. Automatically you're thinking, okay, that's going to feel heavier. Yeah, you're right. It's going to feel heavier. It's going to be harder. It's going to be more for a power and strength focus. Like if you're a boxer and you're really working on a knockout, you want impact energy, distal load is going to give you that. But what's important to understand is the stress on the joint. Proximal load is easier. We generally start here. Loading what we call belly up or in the upper area is really important and reversing it belly down. That's the first progression before you add weight. And just remember our research has shown and you can check also in our research links that a small movement of load from the hip to the knee can increase workload on the system by up to 25%. Imagine how much weight you have to add in a squat to get a 25% workload. Next area is front versus back loading. Very simple in biomechanics, anterior and posterior which of course leads you to talk about the anterior chain muscles and the posterior chain muscles. Putting the load on the back emphasizes the muscles of the back. Putting the load on the front emphasizes the muscles of the front. It's as simple as that. And now we talk about internal and external or inner and outer. And that simply means having the load addressed or wrapped towards the inside of the body, to the inside of the leg, toward the inside of the midline versus the outside. And what this does, this is where technical movement gets really exciting. Because in technical movements, a tennis serve, a golf swing, uh, a, a martial arts punch, a kick, a swim, there's a lot of rotations. 
and we can assist and resist rotations depending how we put those loads in oblique position. But don't start there. And especially if you're in a running or cyclic activity, try to keep your loads a little neutral. Front, back, a little bit of proximal and distal is all you need to know to start. But once you start playing around one or two sessions, all of this mystery kind of goes away. On to the laws of training. Anybody who's spent some significant time in the field knows these kind of main overriding laws really determine the 80 and 90 percent of what the outcome is from a training program. Number one, with individualization, every person is different, so your program and your progress need to be at your level. Don't follow the pros. So the wearable resistance tip number one is if the load feels wrong, simply reload it. You'll find a position within one minute, maybe less, that you'll turn and say, oh yeah, that feels good, or that feels like it's working what we need, or yeah, that's exactly where I want that motion. Because two athletes standing side by side doing the same drill will have a very different experience with wearable resistance. And what we say, you should feel challenged, but not compromised. As a, as a guide, we'll tend to control the amount of load, but we let the athletes tell us where it feels like it's working best. My favorite and the most important one with this tool, remember, adaptations are dependent on the stimulus imposed, not on the outcome we're desiring. A wearable resistance tip number two, reduce the load, not the speed or skill. We see this all the time, especially with weight training, with our meathead gym coaches. And I'm sorry if you're one of them, well, you're a meathead. But what that means is we always just keep thinking more is more, more is better, keep adding more. But wearable resistance isn't trying to create a maximal effect. It's trying to assist or develop an optimal movement. And that has a speed and a technical function that are more important than force or power. If you are seeing the person compromise anywhere in that one, two, three, up to 10% in terms of the speed they're targeting or the movement they're creating, then you need to unload that load. And that's one of the beauties of how we built the product. You can move load in and out of there like that. The body doesn't interpret data. It reacts to data. Next one, progressive overload. To continually improve, you must gradually progress effort. Everybody understands that. And those efforts need to be small if the outcome is highly intense. So with wearable resistance, the big rule is tip number three, progress in grams and ounces, not kilos and pounds. A very small change in load at high speed has a tremendous effect on output and energy. And these guidelines on the chart, on this table, are going to cover you safely for any athlete at any level to progress. On your limbs, you generally use a little less to start, and on your torso pieces, you can do a little more, simply because of the mass that's under that loading. And for all athletes, I generally suggest, and we've seen this universally now, progress in the range from between 100 to 200 grams for one to two weeks. Even if you're a heavier athlete, Coaches, the thing you need to understand, and athletes and people using the product, what you need to understand is, when you're moving at high speed, you're working on technical aspects. The neurological system, different from just force output, is adapting. The joints and the connective tissue is adapting. So if you progress too fast, you're going past the ability for other parts of the movement to adapt. Don't just think of the muscle like we often do with weight training. Last one, overtraining. If you don't plan recovery, your body's gonna force it on you. Anybody who's ever gone through an exam period at school remembers that. You didn't sleep for two weeks, three weeks. As soon as you wrote your final exams, you were sick. You know, it's that old scenario. So wearable resistance is still resistance. And we still need to think of the most important thing, listen to your body. Tip number four. And in order to have safe guidelines that keep you under the radar of overtraining, these are the parameters with which we discovered wearable resistant works. Number one, don't load for about 20 to 40 minutes in a session only. Two, only about 50 to 70 percent of the training session or the training reps for that session should be loaded. It's really important you finish unloaded. An athlete's psychology and mental state needs to be worked on just like their neural state or their physical or emotional state. Finishing and slogging them with exogen in the part of the movement that they've never had loaded before doesn't make anybody's day better. Let them unload, let them reconnect to their body, let them feel fast, let the potentiation come in because that makes them excited for the next session. It keeps them fresh and it ensures you haven't added more fatigue than you need to build up on. The other thing that it does, when the load comes off, it gets them reconnected with the technical movement. And you wanna see that start to happen better and better, better over those progressive weeks. One session per day loaded, don't go to two a days to start. 
three to four times a week. Once or twice is okay as a play time. It's not gonna get you great results. And if you don't understand that, check out my video on the CIA principle. That kind of gives you really good guidelines on what consistency for improvement means. And then every four to six week, at the end of a block, take an unloading week. Go into training, no load. Don't worry if they feel great, just unload them. Last part we'll talk about is what we call the rule of one. And this really means, it really relates to simplicity. Exogen and wearable resistance is purpose built. So use it as such. Keep a focus on one. And by one, I mean, start with one product. Use it on one body part. So go where the problem is or the most obvious place. You can progress to more, but it's too much of an overload for your system to really understand what's going on. Just focus on one training outcome. Don't do five things in a training session. One session or one section of your training only. I was asked a really good question by one of the national athletics coaches. And he said, what about my training density? You know, if we start in the warm-up protocol, can we also use it in the technical protocol right after? And I said, no, because that's compounding it, right? That's now the rule of two. Warm up 20, 40 minutes, technical another 40 minutes. That's too much to start. What's important to remember with something like Exigen, you're investing in a process and it's designed to succeed and produce results. So you need to trust that process and it all starts with having a good play. As always, that's a wrap. I'd love to hear your comments, thoughts, uh, more importantly, Give us your um, input on the videos as well. Subscribe and we'll be back soon. And let's keep moving forward.